Cool, hey everyone. It is so good to be here again. Last year, we had the privilege of coming to the Eastern Cape Equip as well. And this year, here we are again. Also preached first session last year, I remember, on the Friday night. So we must be careful of becoming traditional and ritualistic and doing the same thing over and over. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm very excited, very excited to preach. Um, and I want to dive right in. Um, so I, you probably shouldn't do this. You shouldn't quote movies when you, when you preach too often. It can get you in trouble. But I had this picture in worship of, uh, you know, we're talking about victory and we're all frothing to like run for Jesus, you know, and say, Lord, we see you now. We see you riding out against the enemy. We want to go with you. And I remember there's this animated movie called Rango. I don't know if you've seen it, Rango. It's very funny, super, super funny movie. Anyway, there's this one scene where the bandits have stolen the water, <clears throat> like their last water source and run off into the desert with it, you know, and everyone says, what do we do now? Now, Rango, it's like this Mexican, and Rango says, now we ride. And it's like, what do we do now? Well, we're going to go after the enemy, you know? And they all get on their horses in this like Mexican desert scene, like kind of Western 17, 1800s, that kind of, it's like that kind of scene. And they start riding. And as they're riding, one of the guys turns to Rango and says, where are we riding to? And he's like, and you can see this look on his face of horror of like, I have no idea where we're going or what we're going to, you know. And, and then the next scene, you, you see them like riding with their heads drooping back into town. Like they've done nothing because they had no plan. They didn't know where they were going, you know. And I had this, this little sense of, you know, God has won the victory, man. But, but what, what now? What do we do? Like, how do we, how do we appropriate and bring his kingdom reign and rule into this earth? What do we do? You know, we don't want to just be like, I don't know, like Jono says, these guys with spatulas running at a spider now, you know? Um, we, we want to know, God, where, do we, where, where are we going with this? And because that's what Jesus wants. He wants his kingdom to come. When he preached the gospel, the way he started preaching the gospel in Matthew 4.17 was, Repent your sins of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He preached the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of my kingdom is going to rule and reign on this earth. But how is that going to happen? And uh, he even prays in Matthew 6, we, we know this prayer. And one of the first things we're supposed to pray when the disciples say, what are we, how are we supposed to pray? Teach us to pray, Jesus. The first thing he says is, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. In other words, Lord, make your name holy. This is all about you. I just want every person on this planet, and you want every person on this planet, Lord, to see you for who you are as holy. But then he says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So one of the first things we're supposed to be praying for before we pray about our daily bread and forgiving our sins and, and all the things we need as people is, Lord, we want your kingdom rule and reign. In other words, that's supposed to consume who we are and what we desire and what our purpose is on this planet. So, but when we, when we pray this, I think sometimes what we do is we think, oh, well, that must mean healing. It must mean prosperity because in heaven, there's no sickness. In heaven, you know, there's so much wealth and riches and gold. And, and so I think sometimes we become very self-centered in the way we appropriate this. And I'm not saying those things are even totally wrong. Maybe there's a place for that. There is a place for that. But it's much deeper than that. When Jesus says, let my kingdom come, it's, it's, it's the relationships, the love for Jesus and the love for one another and the perfect relationships with God and man that he is saying he wants to see come into this world. It is the reign of the king over every part of my life so that all my desires are his desires so that I, I'm free and I hate sin in my life. Not just I, I resist it and I flee from it, but he's, he's doing something in our hearts so that we would hate it, so that we would we'd love what he loves and hate what he hates. That's what the kingdom coming into our lives looks like. That's what heaven looks like on earth. And one of the ways to describe a church is a colony of the kingdom. Because when Jesus comes, he's preaching about his coming, his church, I mean, his kingdom coming to earth. 
And then how does that happen in the rest of the New Testament? It happens through healthy local churches in every town and village and city and country all through the world. And so churches are like colonies of the kingdom. Remember in Hebrews, it says the temple that they built in the Old Testament was supposed to be a shadow, a reflection of the heavenly temple. And so there was all sorts of like fruit trees and there was, you know, the candle, the menorah, and there was, uh, you know, the showbread and there was this, the, the altar and the laver and the water. And, and all of that, when you read Revelation's description of, of the heavenly temple where God lives enthroned, it was all kind of pictured in the earthly temple. It's just a shadow. I mean, it's not the real thing. And, and, and this is what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be God's kingdom of heaven now in some way lived out on earth so that people would come in and they would go, oh my goodness, I'm sensing something that is eternal and beautiful and captivating and drawing my heart to what is his and of his kingdom. That's the church of Jesus Christ, the colony of the kingdom. You know, in Cape Town, there's a road called Herengracht. It's like a good Dutch word. And when you live there, there's a couple of those, those roads in the center of Cape Town that, that are these kind of Dutch names. Now, when I was in, in Amsterdam recently, you, you go down the actual canal, the Herengracht, and you're on the boat tour, and it's like the main canal through Amsterdam. And you realize, oh, wait a minute, and you see the, the, the architecture, and some of that is in Cape Town, the architecture, the buildings, you know. And suddenly you realize when you're there that, that Cape Town and the Cape was a colony of the Dutch at one stage. There was a short period of time where I think it was an English colony. And in that time, I think there were some Victorian-style houses built in Cape Town. And so there's, there's some British heritage there as well. Probably more of that in Port Elizabeth, I would think. But there's, you know, you realize, man, these were colonies of other empires. And it's like they, they, they were trying to copy what they had in their country in the colony. Even though the weather's different, the landscape's different, they're trying to copy it. So you watch these old movies sometimes and you see, you know, the British going out and winning territory in the United States. And as they win territory there, they, they, they're kind of mowing lawns and playing cricket and wearing their big dresses and building their Victorian style houses and having high tea, you know, and, and it's, and it's weird because it's a very different setting, but they're trying to live out their colony, their, their kingdom in the colony. They're trying to bring their rule and reign. Now, all of that is not good. I'm not saying any of that colonial stuff was wonderful and good. It was generally motivated by <clears throat> greed and violence and, and all sorts of terrible things. But really, it is a picture of what we are to do in bringing the kingdom to this earth. And one of the ways that Jesus illustrates the kingdom coming is not through a violent rule and reign. We will make South Africa Christian. We will do it through parliament and government and business and, 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 and kind of forceful media and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. No, the way the kingdom comes is as a seed in hearts. Okay, so one of the descriptions of the kingdom coming is a seed that gets planted. And it's one of Jesus' favorite parables to tell is the kingdom is like a seed. In other words, it's, this, it's this, this little obscure thing that comes into your heart, but in it is the very DNA of God's kingdom. And now it's coming into you and it's being planted in you. So that a seed is an amazing thing. I mean, wrapped up in a seed could be a sequoia tree or an oak tree or some massive plant. Or, or like Jesus said, in the seed is the, the, the mustard. The mustard seed grows into a mustard tree. I don't know. And, um, and it's one of the biggest trees, you know. And, everyone, and there's shade. And, and it's the, the whole point is it's, it's, it's almost obscure, but it comes in and it changes us from the inside out. And Jesus says, that's how my kingdom's going to come. And it's pretty weird because you think, man, Jesus, you've just risen from the dead. Wasn't that your moment to set up your kingdom and say, that's it. I'm going to rule and reign here. I'm going to forcefully, violently cause this earth to be a colony of heaven. Here we go. Let's fight. And that's what some people expected him to do. But he doesn't do that. He says, guys, cheers, I'm leaving. Now you, it's up to you, my disciples, 
obscure, you know, disciples from a very, very um, obscure and, and random place in Israel. It's up to you to continue to plant the seeds of the kingdom all through the world and make disciples. Now go and make disciples. That's my strategy for bringing my kingdom reign and rule to earth. Does this make sense? Now the problem is, is that as much as the kingdom can be placed in our hearts like a seed and grow, unfortunately we have an enemy who also wants to place his seeds of this world and of his way of doing things into our hearts. And it's directly against the kingdom. And so everything in the kingdom that we are supposed to live out, every loving relationship and act and and all these values we hold dear that I'm going to talk about in a moment, these values of the kingdom that we're supposed to live our lives by and multiply through our lives as we plant churches and as we live out the colonies of heaven in this world, There's always a seed that is against it. There's always some weeds that are growing up trying to choke the life out of that seed. Because our hearts are like seed beds. Our hearts are are, are like these, these, uh, the soil, Jesus says. And he's sowing the seed, but the enemy is also sowing seeds. And one of the scriptures for this, um, that we see this is in... uh, the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, 7, it says, Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants. In other words, the seed went in, it, it, it put roots down, but there were other thorns and, and weeds growing there, and it choked out the life of God, the life of that seed of the gospel which was sown. The seed, and it explains it in Matthew 13, 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So he's saying there, there's, this, there's these worries that you're carrying and this desire for wealth and for money, that's growing up in your hearts as well, guys. So watch out. And so we've got a very clever enemy. He wants this world to grow up with the the anti-gospel, the anti-Christ seed, the worldly seed of his kingdom shaping us and molding us so that we become allergic to the real thing. We become allergic to his values. And I think the point that I want to make tonight, and I'm trying to just condense everything for time, the point I'm trying to make tonight is... In order to let the, the, the seed grow, we need to rip out the weeds as well. We need, to, we need to realize why is there this allergic reaction in me towards the kingdom and the kingdom's ways? Why, why am I always defending against it? Why does it feel like the life of, of God's kingdom, which deep down I want? I mean, God's spirit, I read it in the word and I want it. And yet there's, this, there's something in me fighting against his ways. What is this? And I've realized in leadership, it is so important to rip out the weeds as we plant the good seed. I think all of us have been like that in the garden at some stage. You know, I, rem- I'm, I don't know much about plants. And I remember Lilani and I once, <clears throat> yo, my voice is giving in. I remember Lilani and I once, we had a, a garden and uh, we saw this, this creeper creeping up the wall. And we were like, yes, we wanted a creeper to creep up the wall. This is great. And it had these nice flowers on it. We're like, this is great. Let's water that thing. Let's, let's watch it grow. It's so beautiful. Next minute, this creeper is taking over all the other plants. It's like growing through the trees. It's choking the life out of them. And we suddenly realize and we kind of look it up and we're like, this thing is, is, a, is a very kind of pervasive and aggressive weed. This is a real problem. Next minute, this, the, the little bulbs, like the flowers of this thing open up and all this, these like thousands of seeds in every single seed pod just flies through our garden. And we're like, oh my goodness, we've just, we've just propagated and multiplied like the enemy in our garden. What the heck, you know? And it's killing all our plants. And I mean, that was a real problem, you know? Um, And I think all of us, we can be like that so easily without realizing it. The world can sell us all these messages and we can kind of make them look like, it looks kind of like the Savior. It looks like it's offering us life. It looks like that's the best way to live life. 
but it's so opposed to God's kingdom ways. We need to learn how to recognize it, rip it out, hate it. You know, we need to be like, like, some, like these people that love gardens. Have you ever talked to people that love gardens in their garden? While they're talking to you, their eye gets caught on like a little weed. And they're like, they, you can see, they just can't, they can't concentrate on what you're saying. They just, just, just hold on. And they go rip this thing out. And it's like this vengeance, this hatred, or like a snail. And this, this nice old tunny is like, where's the salt? I'm going to murder of the snail and kill it, you know, and you're like, whoa, okay, I'm glad I'm not a snail. And we need to be like that with, with the garden of, of our heart. But I want to say with the garden of our churches, because Paul takes this metaphor of planting and he says, this applies to churches. He says, I'm planting seed in the field. You're the field and I'm trying to plant kingdom values in you so that God's kingdom can grow. And that's what church planting is, by the way. Church planting is not church in a box. I've heard that, some, that expression sometimes. Like we'll give you the speakers, like as in the, the speakers, wherever they are. We'll give you the AV and the little the screen and we'll give you some how do you do it and some chairs and you just go find a building and kind of we'll pop out church in the box and we'll give you the method of how you to lead services and you just follow this exactly and you'll make it happen. But that's not what church planting is. You see, Jesus said in John 12, he said, unless a seed goes into the ground and dies, it will never reproduce. And that's what germination is. It's that the outside of the seed kind of dies and hollows out and, and sheds and the life inside can now grow. And so to activate the kingdom seed, there has to be death. There has to be a bunch of people that say, I'm going to go and be planted somewhere in the world, somewhere, some town, some suburb. I'm going to be planted with kingdom DNA inside of me. And as I lose my life, the kingdom is going to come out of me. As I, as I sacrifice, as I give up the comfort that I did know, as I walk away from that. And, 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 and God, Jesus says, that's how the kingdom comes. It's not just a message. It's a message that's been placed in people and it's a DNA that's inside of you of his kingdom. And when you put up your hand and say, cool, I'll go, I'll lay down my life. I'll move to America, to California, like Andrew's going to do to a, a, a small kind of struggling church in some ways. With a, a lot of potential. I mean, I know this is being recorded. And so, gee, you know, God's going to do something incredible there. He is. But right now, it's a church that has got a history of, of incredible struggles and baggage. And there's, there's so much that could come against that. And he's saying, no, well, I'm going to move away from all that I've got in Cape Town, all the credibility and the nice house and the beaches and whatever else, you know, is beautiful. And Andrew might love or whatever. And I'm, I'm going. And we had to do that, moving away from Cape Town to Benoni. I mean, who does that, you know, <laughs> unless the Lord speaks and, and Benoni's actually great. It's, it's really a beautiful little suburb. We've got two ladies from Benoni from our church somewhere. Yes, um, Barbara, Sonia. But, um, it's, you know, but it's not Cape Town. So, but, <laughs> and that's how the kingdom comes. That's how the kingdom comes. And so be ready, guys. Keep being ready to be planted. That's why we talk about church planting. And when we say church planting, we're not saying church in the box. We're not even just saying there's a message of the gospel to plant. We're saying we're going to go plant people. And people are going to go. And people are going to multiply. And people are going to give up their lives. And, and even if they don't even have to be that gifted, they don't have to be that amazing in terms of preaching and worship and all of that. Because that's not what makes an incredible kingdom church. It's because there's kingdom DNA in them. And they're willing to lose their lives so that they can find it. That's kingdom. Are you ready? So Acts 2.42 says this. This is a snapshot of a church. And I know we know the scripture, but, but switch on because there's, I want you to see that there's weeds growing up amongst these kingdom values. This has become a scripture which has shown us what the OG church, the original well, look like when it was filled with the spirit, when people were born again, when the apostles themselves who had walked with Jesus were leading a church. It, it, it's a picture of Jesus's ideal church on this planet and how they acted and how they lived. And it's become something we need to hold up and say, you know, where are we riding to? We're riding towards that. 
We're, we're going be, we're gonna to be that. We're going to find out how to, to build that by the grace of God and by the kingdom DNA that he's put in us and by bowing our knee to Jesus and bowing every part of our lives and our finances and everything we are because that's what we're going for. Colonies of heaven on earth. So let's see what a colony of heaven looks like on earth. It says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Do you, do you know what your mission is? It's not just about you and your gifting and your ministry that you love or the doctrines that you kind of Jesus has shown you and you love. It's not just about that. That's beautiful if God's done that. But there's something we all need to be writing for. It's colony of heaven. It's the kingdom gospel coming to earth through the church, through his family, his temple, his body, his bride on this planet. So, are you devoted to the apostles' teaching? Devoted. What is the apostles' teaching? So these early apostles had been with Jesus, and Jesus said, go and teach them to obey everything I've commanded. That's what they were told. Go baptize, name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in all the nations. Go teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. And so the message that the apostles carried and that apostles today as the gifts of God given to the church still carry is an ability to show people and move people towards obeying everything Jesus has taught. And all the other gifts help towards that goal. But there is a, a special gifting and grace on the apostolic to go, oh my goodness, I need to obey in every area of my life for me to be healthy. And the church needs to obey in every area in order for it to become a colony of heaven and to become healthy and strong. And, and they were devoted to that, devoted to these human beings, these people, and their, well, their teaching of these people. And I say people because I think the, the weeds that have been sowed among us from when you are small that we need to rip out <clears throat> is a sense of we grow up in an information age where every one of us can be an expert. We can just type into Google's Gemini AI or into Open G uh, Chat GPT and we can say, tell me about, you know, the Sumerians attacking the Babylonians in 600 AD BC or whatever. And like we'll get this in 500 words and we'll get this perfect summary from, from all the experts of all the internet and all the world written out for us. You know, that's kind of how AI is going now. And, and so at any moment we can feel like we know everything and we can find out whatever we need and we don't need teachers in our lives. And 1 Timothy 4, verse 3 to 4, it says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So it's an information age, and it's an age where everyone must tolerate everyone else. And so as long as I can kind of have some sort of pseudoscience and some sort of people alongside me agreeing with what I say, then I can kind of believe anything I want. And how dare you tell me different because I'm the expert and I don't need to hear from you how to live my life or what to do. And, and people, are, are, you're steeped in this without knowing it. You're marinated in that, this without knowing it. The enemy has come with this seed and taught you from young so that when someone stands up and says, you are to obey Jesus and tithe 10%, you're like, whoa, you are to obey Jesus and wait until marriage 
for any of the benefits of marriage and covenant with your wife first. And that's the place for sharing intimacy of emotion and, and spirit and physical intimacy. And you're like, whoa, hold on. I can find something else out. Why, who are you to tell me? Whereas these early believers, the church of Jesus Christ, the colony of heaven is like, tell me, tell me how to obey in every area of my life. If you say it, we'll do it right now. And we'll change right now. And we'll find who I need to teach me and be accountable to. And, and I'm going to live my life like that from now on. That's how the, that's the seed. That's the seed of the word and the spirit that's been planted in you. The kingdom seed. The new covenant gospel that we believe in. Writing his laws in our heart. His spirit living inside of us. Wanting to obey. Des putting his desires in our heart. But there are other seeds choking it. <clears throat> and the question today is, do you realize this? Are you ready to rip that out of your life? Are you ready to shut down those voices and repent of intellectual pride? And say, Lord, I don't want my intellect my, the pride of, I know how to search on Google and read some stuff and listen to some YouTube people. I don't want that pride to, to cause me to miss you, to cause me to miss devoting myself to apostolic teaching that's going to teach me how to obey Jesus. Does that make sense? How do you test this? Well, how offended are you when people speak? Do you often get offended? If that's the case, it's probably because... You know, you get offended when they talk about how marriage is supposed to work and the role of a wife and a husband and how a wife is to submit herself. Even, even sometimes when there's unjust kind of behavior towards her, she's still supposed to love and not give in to fear and trust God in that moment and be a godly wife and through her behavior to win over her husband. And it's like, that's what the Bible says, but that's, it, it doesn't make sense. How can you say that? What are you saying? And in those moments, we're supposed to say, how do I submit myself to the word of God? How do I talk through this teaching so that I can mold and shape my life to Christ, to be like him who was unjustly treated? <clears throat> so we want the value Hopefully you want the value, but rip out the weed. What about devotion to the fellowship? And it says the fellowship, by the way, the definite article is there. So it's talking about fellowship as in we're devoted to being together with one another, but we're actually devoted to a fellowship, to a group of people that God has put together. We're, we're devoted to and loyal and giving ourselves to a body that we want to be part of. And the Bible says each part of the body belongs to the other. It's like incredible belonging, possessive kind of language. We, we belong to one another. So who am I to just break apart and go wherever I want? No, I'm supposed to be devoted to the fellowship. And Jesus says in, in John 13, he says, that's going to be the way that the world's going to know your disciples. Not by just the great miracles of healing and provision and cancers being removed. And I mean, those miracles are great and they can be a wonderful sign and wonder. But the greatest sign and wonder is going to be you guys loving each other, washing each other's feet, going across cultures in a deep way, guys, a deep way. The church of Jesus Christ is called to cross cultural boundaries. And here in the Eastern Cape, there's going to be a lot of that because there's a lot of cultures together in, in one place. And it's called not to just, you know, everyone sits in their camp and every now and then we'll sing a song that's closer and Afrikaans and English. Look, we're doing our part. We're multicultural. No, it's way deeper than that. Yeah, we're going to do a, a multicultural evening and we're going to share, you know, some of our traditions and we're going to learn about one another. And that's great, but it's way deeper than that. You're going to break that divide when you're sitting devoted to fellowship with one another, inviting each other into each other's homes, staying together in each other's homes, becoming deep brothers and friends so that you so love one another, you so know one another that the some of the cultural baggage that might kind of oppose one another that stuff just drops away you don't even care anymore because it's real fellowship it's real it's much deeper and i really believe even just prophetically that god wants some of the your churches to go much deeper and to show south africa where real 
you know, destruction of all the racial heritage that we carry where it really can, can, can happen. In the church of Jesus Christ, in the colony of heaven, where people are devoted to fellowship, giving themselves to this. And that means we spend a lot of time together. Devoting yourself to fellowship. These guys were just hanging out all the time, every day, in homes, in the temple courts. They're just together all the time. But you see, we grow up in a culture where there's some weeds that have been sown. The weeds are, you need to be productive. You need to be productive and you need to be secure, especially in the West. You need to be secure. You need to be productive. You need to make money for your future. You need to work hard. Your kids need to be successful. And schools nowadays are training kids as though they're Olympic athletes when they're just like running against another school. And it's like everything in your life depends upon this. You better be at every practice and every weekend event. And suddenly families have got no time. And they're running in this rat race of we have to be productive. We need to maximize. We need to accomplish. We can't fail. We need to be winners. And all the enemy is doing through that is he's tying people up. So that one day, you know, the little little Johnny stands before Jesus. He says, what have you done with your life? Well, look at my cricket trophies and my little medals and all of that. And he goes, that's worth nothing in, in heaven. Nothing. What did you do for me and for eternity? And they might hear, well done, little Johnny, and get a medal on earth. But they won't hear, well done, good and faithful servant for all eternity where it counts. We need to be productive. We need to be busy. We need to be accomplishing. Guys, that's a weed. We need to recognize it in our lives. We need to go, this is against the kingdom. This is growing up and choking some beautiful kingdom plants and rip it out and pour salt on the snails and say, get out of our garden, you know? Or you need to be independent. That's also been sown into our lives from young. You need to make it on your own. You need to stand on your own two feet, especially in South Africa where often there's a lot of insecurity. Come on, you need to make a way. And you can have insurance for life insurance and pet insurance and car insurance and medical insurance and life, you know. Insurance for the building, you just and professional insurance, just get insurance and guard yourself with with professionals and experts and psychologists and therapy and all those, you know, just just have all these things so that you can live life independently and call on your insurance and your experts when you're in need, but you're not living together. Helping one another, Hebrews 3 verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. God's kingdom colony value is that you would walk with other believers daily encouraging each other, daily looking at each other's lives, and therefore being not being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Like, that's how you're going to make it to the end. But we've been inoculated immunized against that. Now I've got to be independent. One of the most beautiful things is, is to see independent men because of maybe failure in their lives or sometimes God uses sin and moral failure. Sometimes he uses marital failure, but they get to a place like many of us have and they get on their knees and they go, God, I can't do this alone anymore. And all I need is not just you, actually. I need a body. I need a family. I need a fellowship. And we do it together. Guys, this is what we've been called to. It requires a lot of time. It's not a waste of time to be having bribes and eating dinners together and, and in each other's homes and hosting and staying in one another's homes. This is why. This is why Eastern Cape Conference East London get ready. We're hosting a conference in Pretoria. We've told our two little Pretoria churches, because they're not that big, and they got to host the most people. We've said, get ready. Get ready to move out of your homes, into the garden, in a tent, and fill every room with people from the nations. Are you ready for that? And guys are like, yes, we're ready for that. Come on. It's almost like a competition, a challenge. How many can you possibly host and love? And it's going to be powerful, beautiful times. I'm telling you, probably better than many of the sessions in the conference. These are our values. These are heaven's values. This is Jesus building his kingdom on earth. 
but rip out the weeds? Are you devoted to breaking bread? This is our value. In Acts 20, I love it. Paul says he he met with the believers in Acts 20 verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. It's like that was a description of a church service. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. That's what we do. We break bread all the time. We're forever remembering our Jesus and the beautiful gospel that we love. We're, we, you know, it's, it's the same as being commanded to be baptized once when you give your life to Jesus. And some of you, there were many, but some of you who responded tonight, you need to say, I have to get baptized. That's the first step in obeying Jesus' teaching. I need to get baptized. I need to go under the water and die and my old life is dead and resurrect and new life and, and, and go through that to show and to be a new person in Christ Jesus. So baptism once, but communion or the Lord's Supper or breaking bread all the time. Because we are called to be living sacrifices and I will be a living sacrifice. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. But it says, in view of his mercy, be a living sacrifice. The only way we ever stay on the altar is if we keep seeing him as the one who was on the cross for us. The mercy towards us. And when we see his mercy, when we see him riding out in front of us in zeal and passion for us, rescuing us, loving us, the more we see that, the more we want to give our lives. And, and so we're a people of, that have a value of eating supper together and breaking bread. We have meals and we break bread. We hang out in each other's homes and in church meetings and we break bread. It's a huge part of living out the colony of the king on heaven, of heaven in earth. But uh, there's weeds in our culture of my home is my castle. I don't want you in my home. It's my space. It's my special, seek, you know, rest place. Or for many people, it's the place where, that I'm ashamed of because that's where all the issues are. And that's why I don't really want people coming close. And Western culture has learned to live different out there to in their homes. I don't want you in my space. But we need to break that. And, and, and be devoted to giving hospitality to one another. There's so many scriptures in the New Testament about that. Devoted to that. Come on. Paul says, teach our people to be generous in good deeds when it comes to looking after those that would come and live with you. Opening up your home. Eating together. Home is the castle. Or what other weeds are there? You know? If we're going to have supper, this supper needs to be Pinterest worthy. It needs to be garden and home or taste magazine worthy or whatever it is. I don't even know the magazines. And so I can't have people in my home because I don't know what I can offer. And it's like, no, just, just simple being together, praying and breaking bread and having fellowship. Like that's what we're devoted to. We're not devoted to what the supper looks like, what the table looks. If some of you do that stuff, great, amazing. And please invite me. That's wonderful. That's great. If, I, I love, you know, there's certain people you just don't say no to if they invite you to dinner. It's like, I don't even want to spend time with you, but it's fine. I'm coming. <coughs> That's the flesh. It's the flesh. Just open up your home. We're just going to break bread together and be around Jesus. Simple values, but can you see how the enemy from young has sown these things into our lives to choke out the life? Devoted to prayer. And I'm going to end very soon. You see, the Bible says in the end times, we need to be a people devoted to prayer. That's how we're going to make it. We're going to make it if we're a people devoted to prayer. 1 Peter 4 verse 7 says, The end of all things in near is near. Therefore be alert and sober-minded so you may pray. Have a sober mind so you can pray. And the problem is the weed in our culture is our minds aren't sober. They're filled with 24-7, every waking moment, entertainment, input, social media, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, so that we're drunk on all this stuff and we're not sober minded. And it's so hard to get into the presence of God. And it's so hard to worship. And there must be something wrong. And I need the gospel again. And I need to raise my hand again, and give my life to the Lord again. There must be something wrong. No, what's wrong 
is you've got no space for anything because the enemy has sowed this weed into your life called an iPad since you were little and your parents threw it at you to keep you quiet at the dinner table or whatever. And you've grown up and that's what you do. And it's so like in your system, you're so addicted to it that you, you can't even put it down. And slowly but surely, through a million small compromises, it's chipping away at your morality so that you don't even know right from wrong anymore. And you're so inundated and drunk with all of this that you, you can't pray and have real meaningful relationship with Jesus. And we need to rip out that weed and say, in order to have something, I need to let go of something. In order to have life, there has to be some death. You know, in order to meditate day and night on the word of God and be like a tree planted by the river that bears fruit in every season, no matter what season it is, there's fruit coming out of my life. In order to be that tree devoted and loving God's word, it says, first, you need to not be sitting and walking and standing with the mockers and the wicked and having them in your face through your screen 24-7. You've got to cut off from some things, fast some things, kill some things, change your whole lifestyle maybe to have this devotion to prayer so that we'll be this uncompromising bride that's ready for the return of Christ. Does that make sense? These are simple things, simple values, but we've got to realize that there's a very clever enemy. And we can't be unaware of his schemes. And lastly, living, there's the sense of they, they lived in awe. They were filled with awe because there were these signs and wonders happening. There was this move of the Spirit among them. <clears throat> this is one of our values. What happened tonight, where we could have just carried on with really good worship, but God breaks in and says, wait, you haven't seen Jesus yet. Yeah, you're, you're worshiping because you've been trained well, but there needs to be a deeper revelation so that you can tuck in behind the one that's filled with zeal and passion and get behind him and have his zeal and passion flow through your life because you're seeing him. Then you offer your life as a living sacrifice. You run, you say, where are we riding to? And you go for the enemy and you plant churches and you plant yourself and lose your life. Because this, it's a moment that the Spirit orchestrated through different prophetic gifts that came and, and prophecies and scriptures and, and the Lord built His church. You know, the other day we were in Josh Jen and uh, with, one, with their elders gathering a couple of weeks ago and we had this moment in worship which was... <laughs> So sweet. I mean, I, I've had so many of those, but this one really stuck, stood out. <clears throat> and there were some prophetic words. Then there was a tongue and an interpretation of tongue. And everything just streamlined and flowed. So it was the Holy Spirit speaking. Then Mervis, good old Mervis, try, gets out and he's like, hey, there's this song I felt to sing. He starts singing this most beautiful song that I don't know where he got it from. And he starts singing this song about the bride and being ready for Jesus and what the church of Jesus Christ needs to look like. And the revelation is hitting so deep. And the Lord is building his kingdom in us in that moment. It was a sign and a wonder. It was a move of the Spirit. And Andrew got up and he said, guys, we need to be this kind of people. No man, no team, no professionalism could ever have orchestrated and made that happen. That was God building his church. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere in all the world, in any of the tents of the wicked, no matter how beautiful they might be in all the world. I want to be there. Just, I just want to be a gatekeeper watching that happen. That's, that's the place I want to be. Because, <clears throat> so this is, a, this is a value that the Lord builds His church, that we're filled with awe and wonder, often. But the weed of this culture is it's is flesh and the arm of flesh and professionalism. Everything must be perfect. Everything must be controlled. And we look at the concerts and the stages of the world and we try to copy it. The other day, see, don't you sometimes watch YouTube worship and you just get sick? Because you look at it and you go, this is like, this could be a, I don't, I don't know pop people. I don't know any pop people. Justin Bieber, I don't know. Is he still a thing? Like, this could be a Justin Bieber concert, you know? And because it, it's just everything's so spectacular. But you're like, I wonder if Jesus is even there. Because, and we look at that and we go, that's what we need to build. 
We need to get the lights right and the sound right and the speakers right and the vibe right and the atmosphere right and the, everything needs to work perfectly and it's going to be so amazing. And it's like, no, these things work against. But we grow up going, that's beautiful, but it's not. God's going, I just need the most simple anything but a people that worship and are willing to use the gift so that people are not coming to sit and watch, but they're coming to say one brings a psalm, one brings a hymn and a spiritual song and a prophetic word and a word of instruction and everyone's involved and Jesus is building his church. And we all come ready and everyone comes going, I'm the minister today. He's, he might lead the church and have a role as an elder and do some directing stuff, but I'm a minister of Jesus. I'm a priest of the most high God. His spirit lives in me. I'm coming here to give, not receive. This is going to be incredible. And if I receive something great, you know, these are our values. This is what a colony of heaven looks like on earth. This is our call. And I want to ask us, is that your vision? Do you all still know what we're building? What we are building? Not what you are building. Not what you are just called to. What are we called to? You know, more and more, Jesus is saying, this, it's about the field. That's what it's about. It's, about. it's not about my church. It's about our churches. It's about God building these values in every one of the churches that are part of the field he's entrusted us to be in and work in and labor in. And we need to be like those people that go, it doesn't matter what's going on in my life, like whatever season I'm in, how difficult and all of that. I, there, there's something more important that's being built for all eternity. And so I'm going to face the season I'm in. I'm going to face the battles. I'm going to, I'm going to find grace through the people and fellowship and all these means of grace I've just spoken about. I'm going to find that. We're going to push through that. But there's a goal. We're building something. We're doing something together that's more beautiful and more glorious than anything else on this planet. It's the church of Jesus Christ. It's heaven on earth. It's literally heaven on earth. The guy was asked, why are you chipping away at that rock? Shame, poor you. Just sitting here day after day, chipping these rocks. What do you, that's, I'm so sorry for you. The guy's like, what do you mean? I'm not chipping away at rocks. I'm building a cathedral. Hey, you know that illustration? I'm building something beautiful. And so it's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do what I need to do and play the part I need to play. But in my mind, all of us are picturing this, this church, the OG the one Jesus first planted and said, that's going to reproduce for the next two, three thousand years, however long, until I come back. And there's going to be a whole lot of people with hearts submitted, kingdom rule and reign in their lives. Can we pray? This is what we give ourselves to, hey? Let's pray. Maybe you can stand as we pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And the, the response that I think we're calling for. The response that we're calling for is, is a, a repentance. How do we rip out the weed? Well, we recognize it. We repent of it. We say, Jesus, by your spirit, we will put to death what is not of you. We will kill it. We'll pour salt on the snail. We'll rip out the weed. And we will water what is of you. And, and, and feed what is of you. These values in our lives. And we'll discipline our bodies. You see, it's beautiful the moment we had receiving victory in the hands of Jesus by grace. But it's living in a colony of heaven and that's going to keep that victory. That's going to sustain that victory. And it's going to help you to be more than a conqueror. So that you bring conquering victory into others' lives. That's what more than a conqueror is. It's someone who reproduces victory. It doesn't even just stay with you. And so Jesus, we, re we just want to recognize whatever you've highlighted in the name of Jesus and by the power of your spirit. Would you reveal it so that we see it for what it is? It, it is not salvation. It is not good. It is not the best way of living. 
It might be the way we grew up. It might be the values we were taught through media and even our parents or whatever. But we we turn away from that. We want your values in Jesus' name.